Pray that the Lord blesses you. Let's uh, pray. Let's come to our, our Father in heaven. Uh, Father, we ask tonight that you would help us draw close to you. Forgive us our sins. Renew a right spirit within us. And cause, O oh Father, that as a result of tonight in our worship together, we would be walking closer with you. And Lord, dwelling in your love. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I've just, there's lots written about John, of course. There's three epistles, there's the Gospel of John, and there's the book of Revelation, and uh, written by him under the uh, guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there's lots of material there, uh, but I'm just going to focus on two things uh, about John that I, I get from his, his life. Uh, number one, we can expect the Lord to work in our lives, to change us for the better, especially as we see ourselves being loved by him. And the second one is God has his own unique plan for your Christian life that is specific for you. Jesus says about John and his brother James in Mark chapter 1, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Bonerges, which is the sons of thunder. So when you hear sons of thunder, what do you think of? This, I want an out loud answer. What are you thinking of when you hear sons of thunder? Loud guy. Loud guy? <laughs> I never thought of that. Okay. Bigger than life. Okay, Dave. Uh, I was going to say loud voice. Okay. Anyone else? Two brothers named Sons of Thunder. Wow. Yes. You think of thunder. And when you think of thunder, what do you think? Is that friendly or scary or frightening? Yeah. Or fierce. It can be all of those things. So I, I think there's an element of maybe even loud in that, um, in the name Sons of Thunder that Jesus gives them. Uh, there's another few verses that kind of give us uh, an insight into John's, uh, who he is. So in Luke 9, verse 49, it says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. This is James and John. And we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. In other words, if you do not belong to John's group, you don't belong. And uh, only who belongs to him, I guess you call this a really sectarian type spirit. Um, uh, uh, John doesn't see you as a part of the group. And Jesus corrects him for that. And then in Luke 9, verse 54, and when his disciples James and John saw it, Lord, you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? So they're heading, Jesus has got his mind set towards to go to Jerusalem. He sends people ahead to go into Samaria, but the Samaritans don't receive Jesus. And uh, with customary hospitality, I'm guessing, and John and James are put out by it. And they say, shall we call down fire, you know, lightning bolt, and destroy these people? Jesus has to correct them about that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you, you don't want to kill people. That's not a part of our ministry. All right, so if you get involved with a church and the ministry is trying to hurt other people, that's probably where you should not be. Anyway, so, and then Mark 10, verse 35, 
uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Always watch out for something, a statement like that, because it's coming. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So they're interested very much in self-advancement, self-glory. When you put all of those together, I get John to be a fierce, self-focused, get-ahead type of temperament. That that's who John is. He's a take-charge type of guy and thinks he should be in charge. And uh, he's also a protector of the cause. Now, not all those characteristics are evil in themselves. For instance, to desire to leadership, to be an elder, uh, scriptures are clear that that's a good thing. But all of these things need to be kept with some boundaries with it. We need to be careful with that. Uh, if you're like James and John, who are merely thinking of their own self-glory, that's not good. But if you want to be a leader, uh, that's okay. But it comes with some boundaries, and it comes with a servant's heart. Uh, a humble heart is what you need for that. So... And to be protective of the church and what goes on within it is a good thing. You want to have that. But to want to call down lightning to kill people is another thing that you don't want. So, that's kind of John. I see him as before Jesus' death and resurrection. The Holy Spirit worked in John's life, though. Through the three years of ministry with Jesus, Jesus correcting him, Jesus modeling for them what uh, he required of them. And, and in the end, towards the end of John's life, you just see a beautiful, in-character man. He really is beautiful in character. And we need that in the church that type of character so the gospel of john was written roughly 60 years after the death of jesus and his resurrection so john is likely in his 90s when he writes it and what you will find as you read the gospel of john is that he never identifies himself he never says, hi, I'm John, or anything like that. There's nothing that, like that in there. He remains nameless. But you know when he is speaking about himself, because this is what he will say. He's the one that Jesus loved. He says that five times, that he was a disciple whom Jesus loved. Now some might think about that and say, well, does he mean to say that uh, he was more special to Jesus than the rest of the disciples? I don't believe so. Uh, I think John just knew the love of Jesus for himself. And he was enjoying the love of Christ that he knew he did not deserve, but was given freely. I believe that's what motivated John in his whole ministry, was the love of Christ for him. Do you know the love of Christ for you? I would say this is one of the best things I could ever say to you. Uh, in counseling. Jesus loves you. I think that is one of the most powerful statements in this world. And you know that it is not just an ordinary love. It's a special love 
because he sacrificed his life for you. I believe that all of us, each of us here, should believe and know deep within themselves and remind yourselves every moment of every day that I am loved with a remarkable love with Jesus from him. I was, my brother's funeral service was yesterday and uh, he chose the hymns that he wanted sung at his funeral and he had big pipes with amazing grace and um, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. But of all the songs he had on there and the one that he had his pastor's son come and sing to him weeks before he died was this. Jesus loves me, this I know. And I believe this is what transformed John's life. Gone from John's life is a desire for self-glory and being number one. Throughout the book of Acts, when you read of John, he's never the force, he's not the front speaker. It's usually Peter, and he's grouped with Peter then and not James. And then, uh, as time goes on, uh, you'll see in the book of Revelation, he speaks of himself only as a servant. In chapter 1, verse 1. And in chapter 1, verse 9 of Revelations, he says, A brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and patient endurance that are in Jesus. There's just a humility about John that we should all want. The Lord made changes in the life of John over the years and he will make those same changes in you. And we all need to be changed. There's no one here tonight that does not need to be changed. Everyone say amen. amen. We all need it. We are not Christ-like. There are some qualities of Christ that we have, thank God, but... We need that to continue and to pray that that continues in our lives. Now, the second thought I had here uh, rising from John's life is that God has his own unique plan for your Christian life that is specific for you. Should you expect that your Christian life follows someone else's Christian life, Exactly. Should you have the exact same type, sorry, the same ministries, length of ministries, same uh, what we would call successes in ministry? Do you think that each person should have the same successes in their Christian life. No. Sometimes that's a shock for us. Because we think they should be about us anyway. Maybe not everyone else, but at least for us, right? Okay. <laughs> when I first became a Christian, I wanted to be a pastor. And... I thought I would become a pastor just like my pastor or one of the great pastors I had read throughout the, uh, the history of the church. I thought it would go down the same road, the same path. But it was everything but that. And for years, I grappled in my head that there's something wrong with me. Don't answer that. But... The, <laughs> Because I know, yes, there is something wrong with me, but uh, besides the sinful nature I still carry with me, but I 
did not have what I would call a typical uh, pastoral get in and move on. It was not that way for me. And it took me years to accept that. But that doesn't mean that the Lord's love is any different for any of us here. Each of our walks are unique. And just because ours is different does not mean that the Lord loves you less. We can see that in the life of John. In the early years of being a disciple, it was always James and John. You ever read the scriptures? It's never John and James. I think that's because of age, probably. But nonetheless, it's always James and John. And you know, they were called at the same time. And they both had the same dad. And they both were fishermen. Uh, and very much alike in so many ways. But after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus and the setting up of the church, things change. It's no longer James and John. You see Peter and John. And Peter being, it appears, the chief spokesman there. And then you get into Acts 12, and James is put to death by Herod. And now John's on his own. His life was quite a bit different now than his brother James. His life would no longer be defined by his being the brother of James. And John's life would be quite unique from the other disciples. It appears, because we're basing this on tradition, that all of the other disciples of Jesus died of martyrdom. But John lived and died apparently of old age. And I think that's one of the reasons... Uh, John writes this in John 21. Uh, why did he get to live long? And for many of the disciples, uh, they would have, I believed, because they rejoiced when they were beaten for the name of Christ, many of them would have thought it a huge honor to die for Christ. But John's not. He just grows older. Jesus tells Peter that when Peter was younger, he had freedom to do whatever he wanted. But as he gets older, he's going to lose that. Jesus kind of referring to what kind of death he was going to have. We know that Peter, according to tradition, some, I think, Polycarp might have mentioned this, a disciple of John, that Peter was uh, crucified upside down, but not James. So Jesus tells him that, and Peter turns around and sees John. And he asks, what's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to John? And Jesus says to Peter, If I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, mind your own life and ministry, Peter. John's life and what God does within it is God's business. With, with John. The 
it seems clear to me that Jesus is not happy with Peter's question. I'm going to let you in on a secret that's not secret. That it is normal with people who serve in the church that they have this type of temptation to compare their ministries and service with other people in the church. It can go like this. It's how much one person does compared to the other. The quality of someone else's work compared to theirs or how important their ministry is seen by others. This comparison can lead to jealousy towards others or disappointment and even anger at God. Jesus does not approve comparing your service or your faith with others. What he gives you, he has determined to give you and is unique to you. Comparing yourselves with others and what God is doing in your life and how the church is perceiving you or how you think the church is perceiving you is not good for your soul. You must reject it when it comes. There's only one thing that you need to focus on. Jesus loves me. If you have that solid in your heart, it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. He loves me with a unique, special love. He loves you with a unique, special love. You don't need any more than that. All you need to do then is be faithful. This was one of the sins in the Corinthian church. And if we're not careful, it will destroy a church, as it was hurting the Corinthian church that Paul speaks to. So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 5. If you have your Bibles there, it might be good to follow. But this is partly at least what Paul is dealing with. There's factions within the church. He calls them uh, worldly uh, for these factions. And they're comparing themselves to the different, and they're aligning themselves with different groups in the church. Some are listed with Apollos, some are listed with Paul, some with Peter. And they're all taking up their stances that we are the people. We are who are following the Lord correctly. This is what the Apostle Paul says about himself, how he wanted the church to see him and Apollos. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. As servants, what's better? You're the servants of the sovereign king of the universe. That's all the Apostle Paul says. And stewards, that is, they were responsible to take care of the mysteries of God, the truths of God found in Christ. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found what? Faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. I think what he's teaching us there is that the Apostle Paul does not compare his work with someone else's. He's not looking trying to judge all of his, the intents of his heart because he knows, as it's going to say, that only God really knows the intents of our hearts. That's why you need to be careful. Like for me, doing a, 
a thing on John. I'm like, hmm, who am I to make a judgment on his character? I ended up being, it's good, so I thought, oh, okay, I'll go with it. But really, we don't know people as well as we think we do. Matter of fact, we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. And the intents of our heart, God will judge. I am aware of not, sorry, verse 4, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, that each one will receive his commendation from God. In other words, do not compare yourselves and your ministry to others. Be faithful as best as you can, living in the love of Christ, asking him for help, dependent on him, loving God's people, worshiping him, and let him make his judgment in the end. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, help us. You know we are given to these weaknesses of these sins of envy and jealousy when we compare with others. The ministries that you have given us in your body, the church. Now, Lord, help us to be fixed on the love of Christ. That no matter what happens in this life, whether we think our ministries are the greatest in the world or whether we think, man, I wish I had something else. Father,